Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Alleluia. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. I love to say that and hear you say it back. Anybody here a teacher? Or has been a teacher? Uh, my wife was a teacher for 39 years. And there would be days when she would come home and say, I just need some peace and quiet. Negotiations between nations are often undertaken to end a warfare and establish at least some sort of peace. Labor and management will sit down at the bargaining table to settle their differences in the plant's operation and bring peace to the workplace. And that word, peace, is central in our text. And three times Jesus says it, Peace be with you. And as I learned from the, uh, or remember from the um, presentation, Jesus might well have said, Shalom to you. Shalom. But what kinds of peace, or what kind of peace does Jesus mean? He speaks of what we might call spiritual peace, a peace between God and man. Now Jesus, or John writes, that in his, his uh, gospel, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. That is real peace. Knowing that your relationship with God is secure and that life, abundant and eternal, is yours. And this peace can only be found in Christ. It is a needed peace. The disciples certainly needed it. They were in great turmoil. Their teacher had been arrested, tried, convicted, crucified, and finally buried in a tomb. Their own lives were threatened. And they were confused by reports of a supposed resurrection. But at the bottom of it all was a spiritual turmoil so often evident in the past. There were at least two occasions when the disciples had argued about their position in the coming kingdom of Christ. They were indignant toward one another. And they argued, and they were unable and unwilling to forgive. They didn't really seem to understand the plan for Jesus' ministry and mission, even though he had explained to, it, to them on at least three occasions. They were ready to call down the fires of judgment upon those whom they deemed unworthy. Yes, they needed peace with God. They needed a renewal of their relationship with him. And the same peace is needed by millions of souls throughout the world. Needed by a Buddhist in Cambodia who seeks to achieve enlightenment or a sense of inner peace through meditation, the practice of morality, and the pursuit of wisdom. Peace is needed by the African who turns to the witch doctor for protection from the spells of witchcraft. Peace is needed by the Muslim who tries to find it by adhering to the laws of the Quran. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, let's see. I mentioned the Muslim, didn't I? Uh, peace is also sought by the Mormon, who believes it can only be found in obedience to the Book of Mormon. And interestingly, peace is even the longing for the atheist, who denies the existence of, existence of any transcendent God, but wonders what will happen when he dies. We need a renewal of peace today. When Jesus neared the end of his earthly ministry, we hear that he wept over the city of Jerusalem. And he said, O Jerusalem, 
Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you would not. I've often wept over the turmoil among members of my past congregations, couples who have called it quits on marriage because they're no longer in love or they just can't seem to get along. Families torn apart by alcohol or drugs, members who have removed themselves from the worshiping congregation because they don't feel a need to be in church on Sunday or they don't feel welcome by the congregation. People who have experienced death and family trials alone because they don't want the pastor involved or they don't feel that the congregation really cares. One commentator put it this way. Many, it is to be feared, fancy that they are on their way to heaven, who are on their way to hell, that they are at peace with God when their only peace is that of the river, which is locked in ice, the quiet and silence of a tomb where there is no disturbance, just because there is death. We need peace with God. We need a restoration of our relationship with him, lest we also face an eternity of death and it's the world's false promise of peace. Where do we find it? Well, we learn that it is a purchased peace, and peace, of course, is costly. Excuse me a minute. Even temporal peace isn't easily obtained. Wars are fought to settle conflicts and restore peace. Compromises are made in order to prevent the outbreak of armed confrontation. Peace always has a price, and often the price is high. But spiritual peace, it comes at a much greater cost. Matthew Henry, a well-known commentator, wrote these words. Peace is such a precious jewel that I would give anything for it. Martin Luther claimed that the peace of God is inseparable from the cross and troubles in this life. This peace is high price, too high for any of us to pay. None of us can ever pay the price demanded to bring us peace with God. None of us can atone for our sins and restore peace between God and man. Its cost exceeds every effort by anyone who would attempt to find it apart from Christ. This peace is purchased for us all, though, by Christ. Bishop Fulton J. Sheen wrote, I love this passage, by the way, scarred men come for healing only to scarred hands. Only a risen Jesus with scars can understand our hearts. Come, Jesus of the scars. And we often fault Thomas in our tech for his text for his doubting. But the rest of the disciples weren't any better. It was only in seeing the scars of Jesus that they were brought to faith. The scars on Jesus' hands and side are the only basis for peace with God. For these are the scars that bore the sin of all humanity. These are the scars that were made by God's righteous wrath, poured out in punishment for the sin of the world. And these are the scars that bring us peace. These scars testify to the pain and suffering he endured to obtain our peace and to the victory that he gained over Satan, sin, and death by his resurrection. And this peace 
is also a mediated peace imparted to those who stand in need. The disciples to whom Jesus spoke these blessed words had done nothing to earn this peace that Jesus pronounced, just the opposite. They had fled from him in his time of need. They huddled together in fear in the upper room, behind locked doors, living in unbelief that Jesus had truly risen. And now suddenly Jesus stands in their midst and he says, peace be with you. Well, Jesus still speaks peace to all those in need through his church. Jesus said to his disciples, as the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Well, Jesus continues to grant peace to the world through his people, his church. The church proclaims peace in the absolution of sins. The word of the pastor isn't the pastor's word, it is the word of Christ. The forgiveness of sins which the church speaks isn't the church's forgiveness, it is the forgiveness of Christ, purchased by him with his body and blood and pronounced by him through his chosen instruments. The church grants peace in the sacrament of holy baptism. When one is brought to that font, he is brought into the kingdom of God. Sins forgiven, new life is given. The invocation at the beginning of each of our services of worship recalls our baptism and the promises God made to us in that sacrament. The church then distributes peace in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, where the true body and blood of Christ are dispensed at this altar, and peace, peace is proclaimed as we receive those gifts for the forgiveness of our sins and the restoration of our life with Christ. Now this is the work to which the Lutheran Heritage Foundation is committed. We translate, publish, and distribute books that help people throughout the world understand more clearly what the Bible teaches and that they may find the peace they are desperately in need. We provide solid, biblical, and faithful Lutheran publications to, to pastors, to missionaries, to churches, uh, so that they may share this good news of peace in Christ with those who do not know that Jesus has accomplished this. We bring these resources to people in more than 160 languages, in nearly 100 nations of the world, and we do so free of charge. As a recognized service organization of the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, we support the efforts of our missionaries in their assigned regions, and we help train indigenous pastors so that they might proclaim the peace that Jesus brings faithfully. In the country of Cambodia, a pastor by the name of Pham Prune had served the congregation for four years. However, he knew very little about baptism. As he said, he had only heard about it, didn't know what was important about it or why it was done. Well, one day, he attended a seminar that LHF sponsored on the basics of the Christian faith. They used Luther's small catechism as a textbook. And it was there that he learned the importance and blessing the holy baptism bestows. Immediately, he sought and received the sacrament of baptism for himself and began to teach it faithfully to the people of his congregation. Peace is what Christ announces to us today peace our world needs, and the peace Christ has purchased for us, and the 
the peace that Christ continues to proclaim through those who have received that peace, his church. Amen. Now may the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus to life everlasting. Amen.